Welcome to church. Y'all glad to be here. It's already been so good. I call this week the Easter hangover week, all right? Because some people, they're like, I got my church in for the year and they don't make it today. But you all did. I'm so glad you're in the room. And I also want to say welcome to everybody who's online. And if we haven't met, my name is Kyle and I get to serve as the lead pastor here. And I am pumped to preach today as we get kicked off a brand new sermon series. So you came on a great Sunday. We're starting this brand new series called I Am Jesus in His Own Words. And so if you've got a bulletin today, pull it out to the notes page or or download our New Point Church app, or follow along online if you're doing that as well. Um, we'll have all our scriptures on the screen so you can follow along. But um, this series is going to be a great one to take some notes because I can tell you this: as I as I have been preparing for this series, I've been learning too, and it's been so good for me. And I know that that's also going to come out in I in my preaching. So it's going to be a good one to take take some notes so you remember remember what we learned. So A. W. Tozer is a, um, he's a modern day theologian who said this. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when you think about God is the most important thing about us. And here's why. Because what we think about God influences everything we believe about life and about ourselves. For instance, what, what you believe about God will influence your life and how you live. Uh, it, it'll impact specifically like how you treat your spouse. It'll impact how you raise your kids, how you do your job, how you, um, how, how you treat your body. It'll influence how you spend your free time and it'll impact your outlook on your purpose in life. And in general, every area of our life comes into some kind of conformity to what we believe about God and how that impacts us. And so what we believe matters. Last year, I did a series called God is Blank. God is blank. And we simply walk through scripture to find out who God said he is from his own word. And there are several names that we find that God gives himself in the Bible. And we walk through that great series. If you wanna go back and watch a series online, go back and watch God is. Well, this year, I wanna add to that. And that's why we're doing this series called I Am. I want you to turn with me or look on the screens to this verse in Colossians. This is a letter that Paul wrote to the churches in the area of Colossae. And he says this. He says in verse 15 of chapter one, he says, the son, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And then verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Jesus is the image of God. He is the firstborn, the preeminent over all creation. And here's what I want to do in this series. I truly and firmly believe if you want to know God, you have to know Jesus. I, I want you to write in your notes today. One of my youth pastors said it this way, and I've remembered it ever since, but Jesus is God in a bod. Jesus is God in a bod. And so what those verses point out to us is that he is the image, he is the reflection, he is of the, of the character and the nature of our creator God. He, he is someone that we are to peer into and look into how he carried himself, how he acted, how he lived. And we have the written record of that in scripture. And so if we want to know God truly, we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to him. Uh, would you agree, or maybe you've had this experience that um, sometimes you think you know somebody and then you find out you had no idea, right? You had no idea. Well, for me, uh, generally, you don't want that to be a bad thing. You want that to be a good thing. Like I had no idea they were so awesome or so good or so kind, right? And uh, for me, I had that experience. Uh, my, my dad unexpectedly passed away a couple of years ago. 
But before he passed away, um, we, we had this opportunity to take a, a really long trip to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And so uh, my, my dad's a farmer by trade. And so we were going down there to look at buying a piece of equipment. And, uh, and he was going to go by himself. And I'm like, you know, I don't want him to drive all the way. It's an 11 hour drive there, 11 hours back. And so I decided, all right, I'm going to go. I'm going to show for him. So we hopped in the car on a Friday. And then we were going to make the trip down on a Friday, the trip back on a Saturday. Saturday. And so we hop in, we're driving. And if anybody knew my dad, my dad was super reserved, super quiet, super calculated in everything he did or said. And, uh, and so I expected the trip down there to be in, like really silent, like the whole way. I'm just driving, you know? And, uh, but as soon as we got in the car for the entire 11 hour trip, he did not stop talking. He just <laughs> talked the entire time. And like my dad was an awesome dad. He was around a lot. And I thought I knew him until I was in a car with him talking for 11 hour straights. And I really got to know him. It was such a cool experience. I wish I could have recorded every moment of that uh, 22 hour trip. But some of the things that I found out, like, like I, I learned about his childhood growing up and the sport, his sports achievements, the schools he went to, the degrees he had, the businesses he started and some, some things. Like my dad was one of the best basketball players in the state in high school. That was something I, I didn't know. I knew he played well. I knew, I knew he was a good athlete, but the fact that he played in some of the, uh, the tournament games and it was one of the best players. That was pretty interesting to me. I also found out that my dad was not only a pilot, but he also built and flew his own planes. And so I got to listen to how he did that. Um, I also found out my dad was one of the first computer programmers when computers came out. And if anyone knows my dad, you would have never thought that about him because technology was not his thing. But he was one of the first ones ever to begin programming at Conoco uh, on computers when they first came out. And, uh, and so, you know, I thought I had known him, but, but when, I, when I really spent time with him, I got to know him so much better. And it changed my perspective on him and on life for the better. And I think just for an instance, I think this is a great example of so many of our relationship with God that we think we know him, maybe because we've come to church or heard some things about him, or I read my daily Bible verse from version, or uh, maybe I, I saw a, a, a post on Facebook one time that talked about God. But the question is, do you really know him or are you only receiving secondhand information? Do you really know him? Do you know God's character? Do you know what he's like? Because God wants us to have a relationship with him where we get to know him personally. So the question I would ask is, do you know God personally? Because when we get to know him personally, it will change us. It'll change our outlook on life. And that's what we're going to do in this series. My hope is that when you and I, when we dig into God's word to find out more truly who he is, it's going gonna, it's gonna to transform us. Do you want to be transformed? This is where it begins. This is where it begins. Now, here's the good news. Here's the good news I want to tell you. God wants us to know him. You might have grown up thinking that God is some distant being on a cloud with a lightning bolt and he just wants to get all humanity, right? He just wants to get you. He's out to make life boring and not fun, right? He's out to just judge you. But that's not our God. Our God desires that we know him personally and intimately, so much so that he doesn't just tell us who he is in his word. He shows us through, through the, the very, he's revealed himself to us very clearly and plainly through Jesus, through Jesus. Doesn't just tell us, he shows us who he is. Listen to these verses. We're gonna be in the book of John in this entire series. The very beginning of the book of John, chapter one. John chapter one, verse one. John records this. By the way, John is a disciple of Jesus. He's an apostle. He, he walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus. He knew Jesus personally. And as he was getting towards on an age, he decided, I've got to write down what I've seen firsthand and experience. So John writes a, a historical biographical account of the life of Jesus and his ministry. And we have it starting here in chapter one, verse one. Here's what he says. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, 
And that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Skip on down to verse nine. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. It was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, here's the good news, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children, born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Now look at verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. If you read through John's gospel, you're gonna quickly find out he talks in a way that you may not understand. <laughs> As we read this first few verses, it's kind of easy to get bogged down or confused that what is John talking about? Well, John was writing not just a biographical account of the life of Jesus, but he's also writing a theological account of the life of Jesus. In a way, he wants us not just to understand what happened, but he wants to help us to interpret what it means. And so in the very first few chapters of, or first few verses of his gospel here, he uses these words to describe Jesus. And before he even gets there, he, he echoes these three words, in the beginning. Now, does that sound familiar to some of you who grew up in church? In the beginning, Genesis 1, chapter 1, the very beginning of all creation, the very beginning of the Bible starts out, says, in the beginning, God created. And John is intentionally echoing that because here's what John wants you to see is that the story that we have recorded in scripture from cover to cover is the story of one God, the same God who is the creator of heavens and earth and who is now revealing himself through Jesus. It is the same God. He goes on to say, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word. Now, in the beginning of Genesis, the word was what was spoken. The power of God, the creative power of God came out of him, created life and, and, and newness. And that was, all of creation was spoken into being by the word of God. And we find out that John is taking this spoken word and he's saying, now it's been manifested in flesh. The word has made himself among us. He, he has taken on flesh and he is here. The very power, the very personification, the very life of God is now in flesh. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God in the beginning, which we know that Jesus has been, always has been, is equal to God and always will be. He was not created. He has always been. He was with God in the beginning and he is with us in the flesh. In the scriptures, we see him in the flesh. And this is what John is referencing too. He's saying this and he's giving us some insight into the identity of who Jesus is. And he writes it down for these purposes. Look at John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, but these are written. And he's talking about, this is towards the end of his gospel. He's talking about the things he's writing, but also the stories he's telling about uh, Jesus's life that he's recording. He says, these things are written so that you may, what? Say it with me. Believe, Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Can I tell you today, our God so much wants us to know him that he sent Jesus in the flesh and he led men of God to record it down so that we might know what actually happened so that we can believe and have life in his name. The number one response of today in this entire series is for you to receive the life that God wants to give you, eternal life forever by believing in the name of Jesus and life here and now abundantly. That's what God wants for you. Now, did you, did you see the very final phrase there? We put it back up for a second. He says, he, so that you have life and verse, life where? In his what? Say with me, his? Name. And what name is that? 
It's the name of Jesus. Did you know the, the very name of Jesus means the Lord saves? The Lord saves. So even the name itself, God is signifying that Jesus is the savior of the world. The Lord saves. The Lord saves. You know, names are important. Names are, are they, they hold, so for so many of us, they hold significance and meaning. I, I remember when we, when we named all of our kids, I've got four kids, uh, Luke, Madeline, Parker, and Jude, and two boys, two girls. And uh, Parker it was our second daughter, so second from the bottom, second from the youngest. And when, when um, we, had, we already had had, I remember when we were pregnant with Parker, we, we say we like I did the work, all right? <laughs> uh, well, my wife was pregnant with Parker. We had already had a boy, already had a girl. And so we wanted to do something really interesting, which was we didn't want to find out the gender of the baby. We wanted to just wait till the birthday. And can I tell you, that is the strangest thing to do because before I was always used to like talking to our children in the womb. Hi, baby boy. Hi, Luke. Hi, Madeline. And we already had names picked out. But with, with this baby, you're not sure if it's a boy or a girl. So you just have to say, hi, baby. I can't wait to meet you, baby, you know? And like they could understand what I'm saying. They probably just hear the tone of my voice, but it's a strange experience. So we decided that we were gonna wait. And so we had some boy names picked out, some girl names picked out. And when she was born, when she came out, we looked at her and Shy and I looked at each other and we're like, that name's just not right. It doesn't fit. That's not her name. And for three days, she did not have a name. And we're wanting to go leave the hospital. And I'm like, uh-uh, you can't leave without a name, without signing the birth certificate. What are you going to do? And so we, we prayed over those three days and really just, all right, God, who is this child? We're like, hi, baby. For three days, even looking at her now. And, and God led us to unity and clarity over one name. And it was Parker Reese McGinnity. Parker Reese McGinnity. The name Parker is, is from a title that really, um, that, that comes from this, this title, Park Keeper. And it means adventurer or explorer. And, and when we named her that, and when, then when we began, began to see her life lived out, she's now almost six years old, and that name fits like a T. Parker is our adventurer, our explorer. She's our, one of our wild children. And uh, our youngest is even wilder. It's crazy. But um, it just fit. There's, there's meaning, and we wanted to name our kids something that would, would, would capture who they are, their character, but also project something good in their life. And, and so names are important. And as we look at the Gospel of John, as we flip through, what John records very carefully is actually Jesus' own words for how he names himself. And so if you think names we give are important, when you name yourself, it's super important. And when God names himself, you better listen up because it means something. And in the book of John, uh, Jesus is recorded saying these seven I am statements. I want to put them on the screen for you. These seven I am statements of Jesus is what they're called that John records. And again, he's recording identity, but he's also recording theology, how we get to know uh, God in that way. So the seven I am statements, here's what they are. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the gate. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the vine. Jesus says, one of my favorites, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then finally, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And over this series, here's what we're gonna do. Each week, we're gonna capture, take, a, take notes. We're gonna look into, dive deep into these seven I statements, one a week. And we're gonna really find out who Jesus is from his own lips. I can tell you this, at the end of my life, I don't wanna look around and or I don't wanna be dependent upon someone else's opinion of who Jesus is. I wanna know for myself from his lips, who does he say he is? Because at the end of your life, one of the greatest questions you'll have to own up to and answer is, who is Jesus to you? Who's Jesus to you? And what did you do with him? And so today, and over the next seven weeks, we're gonna be digging into this identity, who he is, who he is. Now, when we look at this I am, I am, 
for us, we're just like, we, we hear that in English and we're just like, well, that's how you would say it. Uh, I am Kyle. Nice to meet you. You know, we, we would say like, almost like, well, my name is Kyle or I am a pastor. And so we, we do see Jesus making a statement about his identity and about his, his name, who he is. Um, but I don't think we really grasp the significance and the power and the scandal of the phrase, I am. And so I titled today's message, The Scandal of I Am. The Scandal of I Am. This phrase, I am, that Jesus used specifically seven times to describe who he is, this is the very phrase that led some to worship him as God and led others to want to kill him. And all he said was, I am, that's it. And so today, I think we miss the significance of it. But if you and I want to know the significance and the scandal today, we need to go back 1500 years in history, back, excuse me, 1500 BC rather, to the time of Moses and the Israelites enslaved in Egypt. And so we're going to go back there for a moment in Exodus chapter three. And uh, before we get there, let me give you some context that God throughout history, by the way, I I told you the the Bible is one story of one God working in history through one people group, the Israelites who are the descendants of Abraham. He promised to be their God and they would be his people and he would bless them and protect them. He would give them a nation and a place to live and many descendants. And then through them, the entire world would be blessed. That was the promises. But then they found themselves around 1500 BC knowing those promises, but not seeing it come to fruition because they were enslaved by Pharaoh for 400 years. And they begin to cry out to God saying, God, where are you? I thought you, were, I thought you were our God and we were your people. You were to protect us and lead us, but this does not look like it. And God was silent for 400 years. But although God was silent, didn't mean he wasn't working. And in time, he brought about their rescuer. His name was Moses. And Moses grew up in the household of Pharaoh. He was an Israelite born uh, man, but then adopted into the Pharaoh's home, raised as one of the, the, the sons of the king, basically, with authority. Around 40 years old, he killed a man and ended up having to run for his life, flee from Egypt. And then 40 years later, as he is shepherding his father in law's sheep in the desert, he has this experience at the base of Mount Sinai. And we call it the burning bush experience because God spoke to him from a burning bush to call him back at 80 years old to go back to Egypt and rescue the Israelites from slavery. And so I want to listen to the conversation of of Moses and a bush. (laughs) Moses and God speaking through this bush. Look with me on the screens to Exodus chapter 3 verse 13. So in the midst of God calling Moses... He says, Moses, I'm gonna send you to my people. I'm gonna send you to Israel. I'm gonna send you, excuse me, to to Egypt to bring the Israelites out. And Moses comes back and responds and says to God, he says, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And then they ask me, well, what is his name? They're asking, what's the name? who, Who is this God? Then what shall I tell them? So that That's reasonable. Moses is like, okay, I understand you want me to go, but who are you again? And what am I supposed to tell them when they ask me? Because they're gonna think I'm a little cuckoo, all right? Verse 13 and 14, verse 14. And then God said to Moses, I am who I am. Like that helps, right? This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. It's like the biblical who's on first, right? You're like, I don't even know what's going on here. Then verse 15 God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, which that title in Hebrew is Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is, say it with me, my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. And in this passage of scripture, it's hard for us to grasp the significance, but this is the first time that God is speaking. He says, you want to know my name? My name is Yahweh. My name is I am. Yahweh, I am. 
I am who I am, Yahweh. And he names himself these two phrases. And I want to explain to you today the term I am and the term Yahweh are both built off of the same Hebrew word, which means to be. It is like the basic, the basic Hebrew phrase that you could say, I exist. And so in a sense, what God is saying is, I exist. I am that I am. And I will always be who I am. And it is the most basic phrase you could say. And it would have struck them so foundationally to say, holy moly, you are that one true God. Specifically because when Moses was going back into Egypt, a polytheistic multiple God society, they have gods for everything. They worship, the entire world at this time was worshiping all these different gods. There's a multiplicity of gods. And what, Mo, what God is telling Moses is, I'm not like any of them. In fact, I am the only one. I'm the only one that exists. I am that I am. I am all powerful. I am almighty and I never change. I am the only God. And you can go tell them that. And that is exactly the foundation. And then the Bible says uh, that, that God is Yahweh the I am over and over again. So much so that from generation to generation for the rest of Jewish history and even till today, that is the title, the name for their God, Yahweh I am. And that is the name of our God in scripture. That's what we know him as. Now flash, fast forward 1,500 years to a Jewish rabbi coming on the scene by the name of Jesus. And he begins to do all these miracles. He's preaching in power. He's healing the sick and the lame and the deaf and the blind. He's casting out demons. He's raising the dead. And then the people around are starting to wonder, who is this guy? What's he doing? The whispers, the crowds are gathering and the Jewish people are gathering so much so as they want to know who this man is and they're not sure. And they have this interaction with him in John chapter eight. John chapter eight, starting in verse 48. It says, the Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? Like, if I saw Jesus doing these things, I'm not gonna just quickly jump to, he must be demon possessed. He's doing these things by the power of Satan. But that's what they did. They're like, nah, this is too good to be true. He's gotta be, um, he's gotta be demon possessed. That's the power that he's using to heal and to cast out demons, etc. And then verse 49, he says, I am not demon possessed. I'm not possessed by a demon, Jesus said, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. And at this, they exclaimed, oh, now we know you are demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets, which the Jews held Abraham and the prophets very highly in respect. They, they, they respect him so much. And, and they're like, Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Huh. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Are you with me? They're trying to figure out. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I, did, if I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. Them's fighting words. But I do know him and I obey his word. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it. Did you notice that? Abraham saw it, Jesus' day, and was glad. And they got what he was saying. Verse 57, you are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and yet you have seen Abraham? Verse 58, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Mic drop. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. You never thought there would be so much controversy over two words, I am. And if you're just reading the gospel of John, it makes no sense to you. But are you making the connection now? 
The name of God for generation to generation is Yahweh, I am. And now Jesus very clearly said, I have existed forever and I am. Now we're looking, well, I am what, Jesus? Did you notice the period in that sentence? It's because he is making a claim to be God's very son and equal to God himself. He is saying, you know who I'm talking about. Yahweh, the great I am, the the God that you worship. So you say, I am he. I'm him. I am God in a bod, in the flesh, in front of you. And in those moments, the Jews said, blasphemy. This is scandalous. This is offensive to our God. There ain't no way this man is God. Maybe he's a good man. Maybe he's a prophet. Maybe he's a a man of, of miracles and power, but he is not our God. And they went to take up stones to stone him. These are the very words that got Jesus to the cross. Jesus was not always the man of peace that we thought he was. He was not always just everybody's uh, beloved figure. He was incredibly controversial because he said things like this. And next week, I'm gonna talk about why his identity is so important because either he is Lord of all, the son of God, or he's not Lord at all. You can't be in between. Either he is a liar, he's a lunatic, a crazy man, or he is Lord. More on that coming next week. And if he's Lord I can guarantee you, I want to spend my life following him. And I hope you do too. These people, these Jews understood what Jesus was saying about himself. But the question I want to ask today is this. Do you understand? Do you get the significance of the words of Jesus and the scandal of what he is claiming? So Jesus preached in power and said these kinds of words, I am And we're going to go on the next several weeks and talk about the other character uh, or parts of who Jesus says he is. But for today, you need to understand that who is Jesus to you matters. This is the question that you're going to have to answer. Who is Jesus? And he can walk, he can, he, he can talk a good talk. But the question that we also have to answer is, can he back it up with his walk? And the reason I believe that Jesus is who he said he is is because he walked out of that tomb. And last week we talked about the evidence for that, that we can stand on. We don't just have to take his word for it. He proved it by everything he ever did. And today you can trust in that. Jesus is who he says he is. He is the I am. He's the son of God. He is equal with God in every way. And he is worthy of our worship. And it's proven by his resurrection. Today, if you wanna know God, let me just tell you, that you have to know God. You have to come to know him through Jesus. I want you to write this in with me today. God, Yahweh, the great I am, has come to us through Jesus. He's come to us through Jesus. You may feel like you're far from God. You may feel like that God doesn't want you. You may feel like you are so distant. But let me tell you, God didn't just sit up in heaven saying, I hope they find me. He came to us. Christianity is the only religion that teaches that we don't have to get to God. He came to us to fix the problem. And he did it through Jesus. Jesus is, I am, Yahweh in the flesh, equal to God in every way, son of God and savior. And 2,000 years ago, he came to show us his love for us. Listen to this, Philippians chapter two. Philippians 2, verse 5. I'm going to rattle off quite a few scriptures here. You can just jot them down or they're rather, they're, they're at the top of your bulletin. But here's what Paul writes. He says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So he's talking about Jesus, who being in very nature God. By the way, let me just tell you, what we're about to read is a poem that was already in existence when Paul was writing this letter, probably around 50 AD. And when he's writing this letter, remember Jesus died around 30. This is only about 20 years after Jesus. So the people that knew Jesus, probably they, they've heard this. And this is very early. This proves to us that the identity of Jesus being the son of God and savior of the world, identifying as God himself, it wasn't made up years later by his followers, okay? It wasn't just something like telephone that got changed over time and eventually he became deity. It was already in existence just a few years after Jesus. 
Because when they saw him raised from the dead, their mind shifted and said, uh-uh, he ain't no man, he's God. And Paul says this, in the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, make no mistake, Paul was very clear. He's not just God-like. He's not just like some kind of secondary God or lesser God. In very nature, God himself did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So what he did when he took on flesh, he made himself, verse seven, nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Jesus was God with God in heaven and he chose to say, I know I'm equal to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. I'm equal, but I will voluntarily take on flesh and become human for the people. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. But why would he do that? And it's because the penalty for death, or excuse me, the penalty for sin is death. And we needed a representative and only by someone stepping into our situation, full human, fully tempted in every way, yet perfect and sinless, could there be a sacrifice made so we could go free? And Jesus said, I got it, I'm in. Jesus took our place, but he didn't stay dead. Listen to this, verse nine says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of who? Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus rose and he proved everything he said about himself and everything that John wrote about himself. He was exalted, not just physically out of the grave, but now he ascended to be at the right hand of the father. Jesus is there. And God himself testifies that at the name of Jesus, his name, every knee will bow. What do you believe about Jesus is what matters. Who is he to you? Listen to this, John 14, six, Jesus says from his own lips, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. There's no other way. There's no other religion. There's no other hope. Now we could be frustrated that, well, that seems kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, selfish or uh, simplistic or, um, you know, we're, we're segregating people out. But listen, if you're drowning and a lifeguard comes to save you, you're not gonna complain that there weren't other options. He is salvation in a body, died and rose again. He is the only way, but the good news is he is everyone's way through Jesus. Jesus. Continue on, look at this, Acts 4, 12. Salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. No other name, it's the name of Jesus. I don't know what you're relying on, your good works, your friends, your family, your parents, your religion, a church, your attendance, your giving, your Bible reading, hope that at the end of your life, you have more good than bad, Wayne, uh, on the scales, but the reality is there's no other way, no other name other than Jesus. And look at this final verse in Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So how do you call on the name? How do you get saved? How do you rely, believe, give your life to him? Call on the name of Jesus. That's simple. I want you to stand with me in this place. God, we praise you today. We declare that you are Lord of life. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And today we acknowledge that your name matters, that you are God in the flesh that came to save us because there was no other way to do it. But Jesus, I'm so thankful that you made a way and the way and you told us about it. That we can believe by faith, not by our works, not by our effort, not by our goodness, because we fall so short. And that every one of us who are sinners, which is every one of us, that God, we have ability, the ability to be reconciled to you through Jesus. Through Jesus. And today, we renew our commitment to you. We acknowledge that you are, you are our God the master 
of our life. And Jesus, you are our savior. As you continue with your heads bowed and eyes closed for one more moment, every week, I wanna give the opportunity for people to make Jesus Lord of their life. And today is a perfect day because that's what I'm preaching about. And your response in this place, or maybe if you're watching online, is to receive him. And Romans 12, as we just talked about, or Romans 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 12 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So right now, where you stand, you can be, become a child of God be forgiven of all of your sin. You can be made new. And if you're ready to receive him as Lord and Savior, in just a moment, I'm going to pray with you where you stand. Are you ready? Today, everyone head bowed and eyes closed on the count of three. If you wanna make Jesus Lord of your life, I'm not gonna call you out. I'm not gonna embarrass you, but I want you to make a firm decision. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand on the count of three that that's you. And then I'm gonna pray with you. And today, we're gonna take a journey from death to life as you give your whole life to him. One, two, if that's you on three, raise your hand, three. Amen, amen, so many of you, good, amen. Anybody else right now that you need to make that decision? Praise the Lord. Right now, those of you that raise your hand and if there's anybody else who maybe wasn't confident enough to raise your hand, it's okay. Let's pray together right now to settle your matter of eternity by giving your life to Jesus. Congregation, we're gonna pray together, so pray with me, all of us together. Dear God, I know you created me and I believe in you. But God, I need your help. I have sin in my life and I need your forgiveness. I believe in Jesus. Jesus, you died for me and you rose again. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. Today, Jesus, be my Lord and be my master. I'm all yours. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Amen. Today, church, let's celebrate those who made the decision. Praise the Lord. Welcome to the family.